Hello, my name is Francis. Welcome to Yahweh to Face. And in this episode, we're going to speak about the, the weight behind this person of the Holy Spirit. How crucial he is to the heart of the Father. Um, Jesus Christ would speak of just how great a price it would take. Or the kind of, like, okay, let me give you a picture here. Jesus Christ says something that, um, it is better for you that I go away because if I do not go away, the comforter will not come. Now, what that, when Jesus Christ is speaking about such things, he's the one that knows those laws of engaging the heart of the Father. No one knows God like Jesus does. And he's just telling us that, look, if I don't leave, the Holy Spirit will not come. That, that paints a picture for us that shows us something, the precious, how precious the Holy Spirit is to the person of the Father. He considered him so precious. And, you know, the picture that um, we've often used, you know, is that picture of Jacob, Benjamin, and Joseph. Um, Jacob, um, has this love for Benjamin, but Joseph really wants and desires greatly to, to see Benjamin. He's just like, look, that is not going to happen. They're, the brother telling him, look, that's just not going to happen. There's no way we can release him unless, <laughs> you know, so there's all these laws in place showing the jealousy of God concerning the spirits of God and how, um, how, again, just how precious he is to the heart of the father. When, when this becomes a reality to us, we will not treat him with neglect the way we have for several years. Because what the church has been doing to the person of the Holy Spirit has been atrocious, to be very honest. You know, um, we were speaking about that earlier on, how every time that God reveals himself to humanity, the response has always been so bad, so bad, so bad, so bad every single time. Um, I mean, you can look at the Genesis story. I've been watching a series um, um, where they break down like the Bible in theologically, but at the same time you're able to just see like an overview and summary of different books of the Bible And you all you're seeing is just this loving God no matter which book of the Bible you look at is loving God Just revealing his love his everything to us and we are just like Nailing him every single time always piercing him every single time um, We you know the, the final and full revelation of God is never seen until Jesus comes and look at what we did to him it's it's incredible and Despite all that, the cry is still, Father, forgive them. And he knew that we we're going to do all this stuff, but he did it so that he can release the comforter. <laughs> it's so funny because now that the comforter has come, after that great price was paid, look at how we're now dealing with him as well. And it's incredible. You know, all the laws in the scripture, don't blaspheme against him. Don't grieve him. Don't quench him. All these rules all over the place. And... It's, it's so sad if we, and this is just speaking about the presence of the, of, the, of the Holy Spirit to the person of the Father. It's not even speaking about the, the, the significance of his operations, the need for him to be released. This is just talking about how precious he is. Insulting the spirits of grace is considered second death in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Just show you the gravity of just that relationship with the Holy Spirit, how important that thing is. We have to be very, very careful. I think the Bible, yeah, the Bible uses the form of a dove many times to describe his dissension and ascension, showing that there needs to be so much care. You know, a, a man of God, Bill Johnson, will speak about when you're walking with a dove on your shoulder, you don't just walk gently. Every single thing you do is done considering that dove on your shoulder. That's how Jesus Christ lived his life. That's how we are supposed to cherish this person of the Holy Spirit. And here we are with spikes on our backs, waving. <laughs> <laughs> like madman and this person Holy Spirit has to endure all that because he has a promise that he will never leave nor forsake us and he has to endure some of us the kind of things that we do it's incredible and we've pretty much just driven him away by you know just the different things that we've done over time um, I guess that was a burden that needed to be expressed because I actually wanted to go somewhere else but um, yes um, this this person of the Holy Spirit how vital he is in our Christian walk, um, how essential he is to fill the heart of the Father. You know, we, we've been speaking recently about um, the book of prophecy and, or the scripture of truth, let's use that word. The scripture of truth is, you know, the archives of the volume of the books in, in the heavenlies. And the fullness of this is seen in the person of Jesus. The Bible says, here I come, lo, I come in the volume of the, volume of the books to do that will, O God. That's who Jesus Christ is, the fullness of that volume of the books, the person of the Father. Now, um, something I've seen in scripture is that the, whenever God is speaking about books, many times there's sealing around these books. You see the book of Revelation chapter four, 
chapter five, sorry. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he had a book in his, in his hand, a scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. You see every time, you know, bind of the testimony, seal of the law among my disciples. You see this thing about these books always be sealed and covered. It's almost like, you know, it's, it's rarely ever a thing where the volume of the books is always accessible immediately. The only time it's ever done is in the book of Revelation when they said, do not seal of these things, but we'll, you know, keep it open. Daniel, you know, when he had that vision, the angel instructed him, now that you've understood, now seal of this thing, because it's not for your time. It's actually meant for a different dispensation. And you see this thing of every time books are shown, there's a need for unsealing and an opening. Now, the book that we're speaking of here is the book of God himself. That's his archives, his volumes, all the pages of God. You cannot unseal the book of prophecy without the spirit of prophecy. And that's the spirit that's been poured out upon us. To help explain this, every time book of Revelation that you see this spirit in, in you know, you don't actually see a direct, um, his direct person per se, but you see consequences and very thin trails. Jesus Christ helps us out. He keeps on saying, you know, all throughout the letters to the seven churches, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. You still see that same thing. And in every book of Revelation, you see a cry of the spirit of the bride when they're able to both speak in unison. This faintness, so to speak, like the small voice, like in um, Elijah's um, encounter after um, running to Mount Horeb to go seek, seek God. He got there, there was a whirlwind, there was the earthquake, there was the fire, there was all these manifestations, but then there's this still small voice, that's the crux of everything. And that still small voice is really what he needed to fellowship with, not the earthquake, not the whirlwind, not the fire. That's what he needs to fellowship with. The same thing, you know, you have the book of Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is actually the volume of the books, so to speak, it's supposed to be like an opening of those books per se. And in that book, you see all these activities. You know, many people, they, you know, because of all these activities, they get distracted and they pull out <laughs> all kinds of interesting things. Many times we'll pull out the revelation of the Antichrist, which is not the purpose of the book. We'll pull out the revelation of the seventh horn of, <laughs> of, six, of the beast, which is not, <laughs> which is not the, the purpose of the revelation. And all this is because that spirit of prophecy has not opened that book for you to see what exactly he's saying. Now, without that spirit, you will not be able to hack in. You can't hack in. If you look at the scene in the book of Revelation, you see the kind of being surrounding the throne room. All those things should just strike fear <laughs> to the heart of anyone. Because this is not in the physical realm where, when they say lightning in the physical realm, lightning in the physical realm is a shadow, a type and shadow of lightning in the realm of the spirit. When the lightning strikes in the realm of the spirit, <laughs> Angels themselves quiver and they respond in the court. The Bible said the demons, they believe God and they tremble. When lightning strikes, there is a, there is a response every single time. So that scene in the book of Revelation is not just a small thing on this, oh, where are you going to? Oh, we're going to the throne room. Okay, just go by a violent day and then turn left. That's not what's happening here. That throne room is massive. There was a man that had um, an encounter where he was taken to the throne room and he saw the radius of that angel, of the, of the rainbow around the throne. It looks like it's going straight up that is supposed to be curved around the horizon. But because of how big the rainbow is, it looks like it's just going straight up. The pillars of the, the, the pillars of the, the, what is it now, the seven lamps burning before the throne, they're like pillars just burning nonstop. So show me the magnitude of this thing. Now this is the throne room. And at the center of that throne, before you break into the center, you have all these beings. You have the elders who cast their, their crown before God. You have the sea of glass where everyone's nature is exposed. You have the fire going before God, the seven lamps burning, and you have these beings, the cherubims, who are able to, you know, stand in the presence of God and behold the Almighty God. And then when you now go past these fearsome beasts, they're called beasts for a reason, <laughs> by the way. When you go past these fearsome beasts, you now see one who sat on the throne, and in his hand, he's holding the book. Now, <laughs> that book is very crucial to humanity's existence. Because the whole point of humanity was that this book be lived out, be opened up and be expressed, be revealed. Because that's the person of God he's holding. Now, you can see the pain in John's heart when they searched who can break through all of this to open this thing. And no one could. But the only person that could, Jesus, is the one that had the seven spirits of God. The full manifestation of the spirits of God. He was the one that overcame and was able to, if you read the Bible, what the Bible says, it's a very fearsome thing. He walks up to the throne room and collects that thing from the throne room. As soon as he holds it, all the angels bow down. 
in unison, all of them. The elders, they all throw their, their crowns again. Everyone is just, I mean, it's like crazy what's happening. It's an incredible scene. And when this happens, he stands and then begins one by one to unseal the book, one by one. As he unseals the book, you see the incredible things happen. One seal, boom, another seal, boom. Even the, the cherubims, they're also shouting, oh my goodness, come and see, come and see, come and see. All this activity, not, not, not reading the book, this is opening the book. <laughs> so imagine what happens. After you've opened the books, the next thing that happens is there's a feast of trumpets that takes place on the very last seal. And there's silence in heaven for about the space of an hour. And then, I mean, just, you can just, I'm just trying to show the, how crucial this thing is. At the end of everything, the people who are able to read, the blessed ones who are able to read, hear, and keep the commandments of that book are the prophets. Now, when they say prophets, we're not speaking about just the one who can. Thus says the Lord, this and this. That is a powerful operation, but that is not the prophet that we're speaking of here. When the Bible speaks about prophets, the Bible speaks of, I believe it's in, is it? I think it's in Samuel or Judges, the seers, people who are able to see into God, specifically those who are able to see what the book is saying, those who are able to hear the word of the Lord and then say it. Just like when um, John ate the scroll, it says, you will now prophesy to many tongues, tribes, nations, and people. That's what prophets do. In the actual sense, the actual intention of God towards prophets is that there will be people who will be able to look at that book and then live out that book without any, 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 because that book is a mystery. Even looking upon the Bible says, no one's worthy to <laughs> take the book, open the book and look thereupon. Just looking at the book alone, you need worthiness to look upon the book. So it takes some kind of strength to do that. And the person that's empowering all these prophets, the spirits of prophecy, the Holy Spirit. This is just to show you the kind of plane that is set here when this person of the Holy Spirit is introduced. We have the types and shadows in the people of Elijah, the people of Moses, the people of Daniel, people of Ezekiel, these types and shadows. If you actually check their operation and their magnitude, you see how fearful this is. But that's just a type and shadow. When the Spirit is poured out upon our flesh, the Bible says that you see signs in the heavens that wonder is on, on the earth. You see all kinds of crazy things happening because of what happens when this spirit is poured down and he will not speak of himself. Isn't that so interesting? <laughs> so when we're fighting our the Holy Spirit because of our agendas, what we're actually fighting is the agenda of God on this earth. When we're fighting the Holy Spirit, what we're fighting is the interpretation of the book of prophecy. I like that word interpretation because something I saw not too long ago was that, um, the whole, you know, the person of God, he wants to be expressed, he wants to be known. God is a mystery, even to angels, and he needs to be known. And so the picture I have in, 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 in my head is God is like, you know, when, when, when I'm, um, God is like a tongue. Forgive, forgive me for this expression here. God is a parable, a mystery. He needs to be deciphered. But when the Spirit rests upon, he can be revealed. So the same thing happens when someone first gets to the Holy Spirit. The first thing that happens is that the language of God is then seen. So someone gets with the Holy Spirit, the first thing that happens is they begin to speak the language of God Almighty. That is the language of the future, the world to come. That's not the language of the present. Angels do not have that language. Only God, he who speaks, speaks only to God. He speaks mysteries. Only God understands them. The next thing that begins to happen is you have these other things, the gifts that come into operation. There's one where um, that, that, the language of tongues that's been expressed is then being interpreted in a language that other people can hear. So you be speaking in a tongue, all of a sudden you begin to prophesy. The whole point of that is that's what prophets do. They're able to bring that hidden person of God Almighty, that mystery of who God is, and then interpret him. And these interpretations have many, there's many diverse interpretations. There's interpretation of the eye of God. There's interpretation of the chest of God. There's interpretation of the elbow of God, because we're all one body of Christ. Christ is the full revelation of God. But Christ alone, you can't comprehend the person of God. He needs at least, if you see the book of Revelation, at least 144,000, that's, that's a spiritual number, not just a physical number, 144,000 people to interpret his civilization, who he is. That's show you the richness and the wealth of that person of God. You need so much to explain who he is. You need the book. You need the, the what is another prophet. And most of all, you need the spirit. It is crucial that in this day and time, we begin to go back to the person of the Holy Spirit so we can understand what the volume of the books <laughs> as for us 
as human beings, as God's people, as Israel, the spirit of God is what we need to go back to, who we need to go back to. Thank you for listening. Please have a great day.